Madam Chair, I think you may be muted. You're right, I was. <clears throat> so I'm gonna go ahead and um, this statement that we had at the bottom of the TNL agenda, uh, just is from, now joining. I just wanna state for the record that this meeting is being held electronically in accordance with the State of Tennessee Governor Bill Lee's Executive Order Number 16, permitting electronic meetings in response to the COVID-19 virus. And so um, I think we might have a few more meetings ahead of us that will be virtual, but this nonetheless is a virtual meeting for us. So we have a quorum and I think I just heard where um, Ms. Elrod joined. I hope that's what I heard so that we have everybody present. Um, <clears throat> we will just uh, go into our governance issues and we have first under governance would be the consent agenda, Ms. Froh. Yes, I need, oh, now I don't have the number. I need to um, uh, pull the ELA adoption from the consent agenda. It's D, it's E. Oh, thank you. Chair e. Shepard, I would like to pull um, D1 and D8 from the consent agenda, please. Okay, um, I was gonna do one of those, okay. That's fine. Uh, anybody else have anything they want to pull from consent? Yes, I'd like to pull the United Way contract. Which one is that? Oh, I see, number nine. Is this Christian? Yes, it is. Okay, all right. And anyone else? Okay, uh, Ms. Fogg, would you like to go ahead with... Uh, we don't read the agenda anymore, but we go ahead and accept a motion in a second to adopt what's left on it. Okay, I'll ask one quick question before I make my motion. Um, Witten Wisdom is for K through five, correct, Dr. Battle? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. Okay, so I need to amend my motion very slightly from uh, our the vote that we just took at Teaching and Learning. Um, so I move to approve the ELA recommendation to adopt wit and wisdom for K through five for a three year period with the understanding that wit and wisdom materials will be used within our current balanced literacy framework along with an array of other supplemental materials. I move to approve ELA adoption for the remaining grade levels for six years. Ms. Froh, this is, uh, I'm going to interject. This is uh, Dr. Sevier. I'm going to let you, you're doing such a great job with that. I'm going to let you do it again when we actually get to that item. There you go. Just on the balance of the, w w everything that was not pulled. So okay. if we can get a motion in the second on everything else, and then we can get uh, that, that ELA and the United Way and all those other things properly before us. Madam Chair. This is uh, Sharon Gentry. I move approval of the consent agenda with uh, of the items remaining on the consent agenda. Second. Madam Chair, you are still muted. Sorry about that. I keep unmuting and then it goes back to mute. Okay, so we have a motion to approve everything remaining on consent agenda by Dr. Gentry and it was seconded by Amy Frog. Uh, is there any discussion on the items remaining on consent? Okay, uh, if I could get Dr. Sevier to do a roll call vote on that. Dr. Gentry? Yes. Dr. Gentry votes aye. Ms. Elrod? Ooh. I she's still not made it in. Ms. Spearing? Aye. Spearing votes aye. Ms. Bugs? Yes. Ms. Bugs votes aye. Ms. Bush? Ms. Bush? Ms. Bush? Aye. Ms. Bush votes aye. Ms. Player Peters? Aye. Ms. Player Peters votes aye. Ms. Poopa Walker? Aye. Ms. Frog? Aye. Ms. Frog votes aye. Ms. Shepard? Aye. 
Mr. Shepard votes aye. Madam Chair, you have eight ayes. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so we'll go down in the order in which they appear. So the first thing we have on consent to be pulled was item number D1, ABM Industry Groups um, operating as ABM and LLC two contracts, Ms. Player um, Peters. And I don't know if I can make a motion to take D, D1 and D8 together. So we don't have to repeat the conversation since they're okay. basically conversation. Right. Um, so um, I just want to put on the record that um, I know now is not the time to consider um, a strategic plan, but when we get to a point where we can actually meet in person and have a retreat, um, I would like to see a strategic plan about how to bring in the custodial and groundskeeper um, operations back in house and do it in a strategic and staggered way where it's uh, financially prudent and um, consistent um, and that we can actually make a, a plan to do it over time just because of the large financial cost it would do it if we did it in one big um, kind of um, one big item at one time. And so um, I just realized my camera was off. Um, so I would just, I just hope that um, we can take this as a bigger conversation for a future date to really kind of think through what's a efficient, proper way to bring it in house, particularly at the time of the pandemic and the COVID where we can have more direct control of how we do cleaning in our schools, how we maintain our schools, but then also the financial part of um, not overlapping operations, having maintenance people come in um, and do work that a normal custodian would do um, in making the maintenance or in-house maintenance time and efforts and resources more efficient, but then also the quality that's tangible and intangible that we can have bringing employees back into the operation house, but doing a strategic way that's financially respectful and prudent and efficient. Um, and so hopefully we can think about that once we get past this current budget year, but also get past um, the upcoming fiscal year that we can think about in a very thoughtful way. That's all I have. Anybody else have any comments or ideas or numbers D1 and 8? I just want to echo um, uh, Ms. Player's comments uh, that, um, that that's a conversation that I would like to see had uh, sooner than later. Okay. And I know that we... Uh, I know that the city has at its disposal uh, a couple of several uh, million dollars, um, and I know that they have to be COVID related. But to Ms. Player's comments around cleaning and you know sanitation becomes a, a different conversation from this point going out going forward. And I don't know that it is out of the realm of possibility that some of those CARES dollars cannot go towards the starting that transition of those uh, of that labor pool back into the family. Uh, of an NPS. So uh, I echo that and would like to see that conversation take place sooner than later. I mean, even if it's if it's pre-retreat, um, I think there's some low-hanging fruit in that space that we can begin to lay the groundwork for what it looks like to have those resources back in hand with us. Thank you, Dr. Gentry. <clears throat> and I agree with both of my colleagues. In fact, I was going to pull uh, D1 anyway. Um, because I'm really concerned about approving them for a five-year period because what does that do to the conversations that we've already had and that we want to have around um, bringing those services in-house? You know, we've already talked at length about that. We know that this is not the year to do that given our financial constraints, but still um, I'm wondering if there's a way that we can approve, you know, this contract um, for maybe two years until we get our house in order and we can start those conversations and, you know, start as, as my colleague Frida said, start doing that on a, um, you know, piece by piece basis rather than, you know, all at one fell swoop. So uh, someone online, if Dr. I don't know if David Profit is on, um, on here or not, I don't know if he can address that particular concern about length, uh, shortening the length of the contract from five down to a, a shorter period of time. David, um, you want me to answer that? Yes, um, Madam Chair, if we can have David Profit um, respond to the current contract length and clauses that are part of um, that RFP process. David Profit. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Battle. Uh, Ms. Shepard, the initial contract term is in fact a two-year contract term. 
Okay. Um, and it is renewable uh, after that, uh, depending on the uh, quality score, if you will, that each uh, individual custodial group would acquire uh, through our scorecard process that we've developed with the principals of the county um, or of the district. So it's an initial two year term. Um, and so uh, for each uh, organization, both SMS and ABM. Okay, that's perfect, thank you. Anybody else have any ideas or comments that they wanna make around these two items? I have one more comment. Um, I like to see a report of the pay scale and the benefit um, package for the employees also um, for the current contracts. So we just have that um, just for information and have it on record. So we also know um, the cost, bring it back in, but make sure we're also providing a fair and livable wage um, for our employees um, once we make this transition and also to hold uh, these two companies accountable. That's a very good point because I, I know that several of the employees who decided to stay on and, and go with, at the time it was called GCA, they took a cut in pay and benefits as well. And so um, for me, it was a moral issue. I know not everybody agrees with me on that, but uh, I thought it was a, a moral issue, uh, what we were doing to those particular employees. And so um, we would definitely need that information uh, as we studied the process um, and, you know, the to bring them back in-house. So, uh, you know, we're talking about maybe, well, Dr. Jones, we talked about maybe even pre retreat, but at, at some point in time, we'll have to get that on the agenda and we'll have to have that, you know, quantifiable information in which to make a, you know, a valid decision. So Ms. that's a good point. Ms. Shepard. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. A couple of things. Uh, one, Ms. Player, first of all, to address yours, when you say the current contract, you're talking about the one that the board may vote on this evening? Yes. Yes, okay. I'm sorry for the, for the contract that um, we're considering. Yes, ma'am. And Ms. Shepard, um, Chris Henson can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe those uh, employees that came over from the original GCA contract, we considered those legacy uh, 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 employees and they came over, I believe, with similar wages. Chris can, can he knows far better than I have that, that history. Oh, okay. That's good to hear. Yeah, that would be correct. In, in the supplemental uh, materials that you have with the agenda packet, it lists the total number of uh, MNPS legacy employees that still remain with ABM and and as David said they were brought over to GCA at the time at the same uh, wage level uh, with commensurate benefits as they received as MNPS employees and we still have a, a fairly uh, large number of those legacy employees that are that still are with ABM. Good all right and, but that is to my colleague's point that is something that we would need to have before we can have, you know, an intelligent discussion around this. So, Ms. Player Peters, do you want to state a motion on numbers sure. um, one and eight? Sure. I um, I make a motion to approve uh, the contracts for ABM industrial groups and also Southern Management Systems. Second, this is Sharon Gentry. Okay. Any other discussion or comments? Uh, Madam Chair, this is Jeannie. Um, I just want to thank. Um, Ms. Player Peters for the leadership on this. I heartily endorse this um, discussion and um, would love to see them come back, especially if we're thinking about long-term, really taking kid, good care of our buildings in, in the face of a virus. So anyway, thank you, Bria. Okay, uh, Dr. Severe, can we get a roll call vote on this? Dr. Gentry? Yes. Dr. Gentry votes aye. Ms. Elrod? Uh, hmm. I'm texting with her. She's still waiting on her computer to reboot. Okay. Ms. Berry? Aye. Ms. Bugs? Yes. Bug Bugs, aye. Ms. Bush? Aye. Ms. Bush votes aye. Ms. Player Peters? Aye. Ms. Player Peters votes aye. Ms. Cooper Walker? Aye. Ms. Cooper Walker votes aye. Ms. Frog? Aye. Shepard votes aye, Ms. Shepard. Aye. Shepard votes aye. Madam Chair, you have eight ayes. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. 
All right, we all move on to the next item in the order in which it appears, and that would be item number D8, uh, United Way of Greater Nashville, Ms. Bugs. I'm just pulling this from the contract again. I should have just abstained from the entire consent agenda, but I'm just pulling it because I'm, I abstained. I work there and I'm again sitting here smugly, but thank you. Okay. So you don't have any additional information or, or any commentary. You just trying to abstain from the vote? Yes. And okay. if anyone uh, watching this online during the teaching and learning committee meeting, there was a presentation done by MMPS right. about the funding that United Way would be donating to MMPS. Okay. Okay. Any comments or questions around um, D9, which is United Way? Motion to approve the contract for United Way for the greater Nashville area. Agree, okay. Nashville. Second. Second. Who seconded that? I did, just fearing. Okay, all right, thank you very much. All right, uh, Dr. Sevier, can we get a vote? Dr. Gentry? Aye. Ms. Selrod? Aye. Oh, yay. I'm all through right now. Ms. Fearing? Aye. Ms. Fearing votes sign. Ms. Bugs? Uh, passed. Ms. Bush? Aye. Bush votes aye. Mr. Player Peters? Aye. Player Peters votes aye. Mr. Cooper Walker? Aye. Cooper Walker votes aye. Ms. Frog? Aye. Ms. Frog votes aye. Ms. Shepard? Aye. Ms. Shepard votes aye. Madam Chair, you have uh, eight ayes, one present, not voting. Okay. All right. And the last item that was pulled from consent is number E or letter E, um, the ELA material adoption, Ms. Pro. Yes. All right, restating the motion. I move to approve the ELA recommendation. No, sorry. I move to approve the ELA, ELA recommendation to adopt wit and wisdom for a three year period for K through five with the understanding that wit and wisdom materials will be used within our current balanced literacy framework, along with an array of other supplemental materials. I move to approve ELA adoption for the remaining grade levels for six years. Can I get a second? Second. No. Okay. Can I get, anybody have any comments or questions at this point? I think we kind of discussed this uh, in detail at our TNL meeting uh, prior to the school board meeting. Um, so if, if uh, we have no further comments or questions, I would ask Dr. Severe to do a roll call vote. Dr. Gentry? Aye. Aye. Ms. Elrod? Aye. Ms. Spearing? Aye. Ms. Bugs? Ms. Bugs? Aye. Sorry. Ms. Bugs votes aye. Ms. Bush? Aye. Ms. Bush votes aye. Ms. Clary Peters? Aye. Ms. Clary Peters votes aye. Ms. Cooper Walker? Aye. Cooper Walker votes aye. Ms. Frog? Aye. Ms. Frog votes aye. Ms. Shepard? Aye. Shepard votes aye. Madam Chair, you have nine ayes. Very good. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate that. So that concludes our work on the uh, consent agenda. Uh, next, we move on to um, the charter school applications that we have. We have five of them tonight, and they begin with the um, NEI amendment report. Uh, uh, Mr. Queen, is he going to be making this presentation? Yes, ma'am. If they'll load the uh, slide deck for me, we'll get started. Okay. Okay. So Madam Chair, members of the board and Director Battle, thank you for the opportunity to share the Office of Charter Schools Review Team's report 
on the Noble Education Initiative known as NEI Amendment Findings. Next slide. The evaluation team consisted of the four primary charter office staff members you see noted here. Next slide. The objective of today's report is to number one, share findings in reviewing Noble Education Initiative as a charter management organization for Knowledge Academy Middle School. And number two, request the Board of Education to determine if Knowledge Academy is to be granted a contract amendment for Noble Education Initiative to serve as their charter management organization. Next slide. Uh, areas we reviewed with the governing board's vetting process, the 2019-2020 school management plan submitted by NEI, current NEI employees supporting Knowledge Academy, schools that NEI is currently managing, and NEI financials. This report is for Knowledge Academy Middle School the, the, who had a contract in 2012, and it is only for Knowledge Academy Middle. The current contract for Knowledge High School, which was a 2015 contract, and KA at the Crossings, which is a middle school who received a 2016 contract, does not require board approval for contracting with the Charter Management Organization, only Knowledge Academy Middle School. So for that purpose, uh, that's the purpose of tonight's presentation. You have been provided with section 3.4 on page eight, paragraph two of the Knowledge Academy contract, which states the school was required to obtain advanced approval before entering into a contractual agreement with a charter management organization. The process used by Knowledge Academy is incorporated in obtaining a signed contract agreement between NEI and Knowledge Academy clearly violated the school's contract provisions. As the authorizer of all three Knowledge Academy schools, it is imperative that issues of such magnitude as the employment of a charter management organization to take over the total operations of a school be communicated to the MNPS charter office and approved by the LEA in advance of signing a binding contract for such services when required. By contract, Knowledge Academy Middle School has required this process and again, clearly violated their contract. The governing board vetting process is reported to have consulted references, held information and strategy meetings with consultants and NEI, examined current schools operated by NEI and engaged the community. Uh, you'll notice by the slide, they failed to provide several uh, re information requests that we, um, we uh, submitted to them. They were submitted on numerous occasions. And again, you can see by the slide, they failed to provide a number of those documents. The Office of Charter Schools only became aware of the NEI CMO negotiations and ultimate contract agreement that was previously executed during an impromptu visit to the governing uh, board meeting by our office on April 16th of 2019. Once our office became aware of the signed contract management organization agreement, James Bristol, the board chair, was, advi was advised that the contract would likely constitute a material change and would need MNPS board approval. Soon after this conversation, the charter office was advised by Mr. Bristol, board chair, that the contract was for management consultant services and not for a charter management organization as pre previously expressed to our team at the board meeting. The language in the contract clearly identifies Noble Education Initiative as a charter management organization. The management plan for 2019-2020, the school management plan was submitted for the 2019-2020 school year. This plan provided strategies for addressing a wide range of school operations, including staffing, instruction, culture, and community engagement. The plan did not address recruiting and maintaining qualified staffing with the necessary endorsements to fully educate children, there had been a loss of 31 staff since August 4th and a large influx of substitute teachers. Student attrition, which is a challenge this year and will require a robust recruitment process and an engaging education environment that addresses the whole learner. All three Knowledge Academy schools collectively have 435 students as of March 24th of 2020. On the academic performance, um, Knowledge Academy Middle School, the one in question, was in 2019 identified as a targeted support and improvement school by the U.S. Department of Education. And as a side note, Knowledge High School was a uh, additional uh, targeted support and improvement in 2018 and 2019. And KA at the Crossings in 2018 was identified as a targeted support and improvement school. All Knowledge Academies Incorporated schools will need to experience continuous improvements in order to avoid a continuation of their current probationary status or further action by the LEA. 
NEI currently provides 14 experienced support staff in the area of academics, operations, and finances to the Knowledge Academy's network. Out of the 14 individuals, only three individuals are located full-time at Knowledge Academy to provide daily support. A concern the team had in reviewing the resume of each individual providing support was that only two had either attended college in Tennessee or worked in a district within Tennessee. With this in mind, the team is concerned about the current knowledge of the Tennessee state standards and Tennessee state laws. NEI pays partial salary for Mr. Eric Lewis, who is the Knowledge Academy Executive Director. NEI pays full salary of Dr. Mary Lawrence Minnick, Assistant State Director. And NEI pays the full salary for Ms. Jackie Sissel, Community Engagement Director. NEI was contacted to take over the day-to-day -day operations of three turnaround schools located in Indianapolis beginning in 2017. The three schools had uh, been identified as, a, as failing schools. <clears throat> in your viewing the chart, you will notice during the three years NEI was running the day-to-day -day operations of the schools, they progressed slowly each year and earned a C on the State Accountability Report Card in 2019. All three schools received a C on the state report card in 2019, while the other schools taken over by the state board stayed on the F list and was returned to the home district as failing schools. NEI works with a fourth school in Indiana, Emma Dunan Elementary School. This is a non-turnaround school in which NEI oversees the data operations. As the chart indicates, they scored higher on the state mandated third grade reading assessment, which is called IREAD 3 than the home district in 2019. In 2018, they outperformed all IPS schools on the IREAD 3 assessment. NEI reportedly works with an additional 11 schools outside the state of Indiana. NEI stated that they have a non-disclosure agreement with each of these 11 schools. Therefore, we were unable to establish who the schools are, what supports NEI provides, or whether each of these 11 schools e even exist. <clears throat> NEI has been in charge of all three Knowledge Academy schools since April of 2019. Four recent complaints were emailed to MNPS, one of which copied the Tennessee Department of Education, which triggered an investigation by this office, the Office of Charter Schools. This board received the completed report as did TDOE. Listed above are a number of concerns noted in the report, some of which also resulted in a total of six notices of, of, of concern being issued to Knowledge Academy schools, which includes Knowledge Academy Middle School. And you can read through uh, the number of, of um, uh, vindications based upon the investigation. Uh, and I believe you have the five page report uh, access to that as well. On the financials, NEI is a young not-for-profit organization. They've been in existence four years that has demonstrated a consistently strong positive fund balance. A letter from Knowledge Academy's uh, attorney stated that there had been no funds provided by NEI to KA or Knowledge Academies. Bank statements were requested by this office on four occasions in order to verify, and to date we have not received any of the requested bank statements. A letter dated February 26, 2020 was received from Knowledge Academies attorney, once again, along with copies of four checks that were sent to NEI from Knowledge Academies Incorporated. A request for bank statements was once again requested on four occasions uh, in order to verify, and we have yet to receive this information in order to verify fund transfers from Knowledge Academies to NEI. Salary information emails were sent on four occasions requesting salary information for all employees supporting Knowledge Academies Incorporated. A statement from Knowledge Academy uh, Legal Quote, salary information of NEI employees. Knowledge Academies Incorporated has provided you with the information it has regarding the percentage of NEI employee time spent at KA duties. KA does not have information regarding NEI's employee salaries. Therefore, we were not given the employee uh, salaries of NEI employees supporting Knowledge Academies. <clears throat> the Board of Education is requested to determine if Knowledge Academies is to be granted or denied this amendment to allow Noble Education Initiative to operate Knowledge Academy as their charter management operator. And with that, we'll turn it over to the board. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Queen. Uh, does anyone have any questions of, of Mr. Queen at this time concerning NEI? 
have questions or comments? Um, I have one. Mr. Queen, um, on all the request documentation that we, all the requests that we made and the fact that we heard crickets on all those requests and didn't get the information, did they give any indication if there was an, a problem with getting us that information or they just didn't reply at all? Uh, they generally did not reply to emails. Um, it took two or three requests, I suspect, before their attorney responded. Uh, and they simply skirted the question and you can see the, the answer they gave. Um, they didn't really answer the question uh, as to why we are not being given access to the information we requested. Uh, and again, most of the communication went through the, uh, the, uh, school, the school's attorney. Okay. Madam Chair, I have a question, please. Yes, ma'am. Uh, how do we, um, uh, I guess, amend, or is there a statute to um, also address the other two schools as far as their management, NEI's management uh, uh, for, for board, uh, board approval? Yes, ma'am. Uh, is Melissa online? That would be a legal question. Okay. Is Mr. Rivera online? I, this, I can give you a non-legal response. Um, charter schools have a legal right uh, by state law to uh, request contract amendments. Uh, our office is looking into uh, the LEA. Uh, if there is a contract amendment that we would like to, uh, to insert into one or more contracts, uh, we're not at the point yet where I can give you a definitive answer. Um, but um, we, we have had that conversation about amending some contracts uh, and what that process might look like. That is relatively new. Uh, and so we've been working with Metro Legal to figure that out. When you find out, would you report back to us to let us know please? Yes, ma'am, I will. Thank you. Is now exiting. Okay, uh, so. Chair, okay, uh, go chair, ahead. Chair, yes, a um, personally, I just find it, um, um, concerning to put it lightly that there is not transparency, particularly when it comes to the taxpayers' dollars. If we are uh, working with um, charter operators to do work, um, the fact that they're being used by taxpayers' dollars and we have a fiduciary standard and responsibility to be transparent of what we do with those taxpayer dollars and then they are not reciprocating that and that we are being paid by taxpayer dollars and in lieu, you know, not in lieu, but then we're also um, they're being paid by taxpayer dollars. There has to be a level of transparency. And I personally find that very unacceptable and offensive that they're not responding back. And if there is a problem with research or time, that needs to be stated. Now joining. And they need to be, um, needs to be clarified and communicate to at least the charter office at the bare minimum. Um, and so I just want to place my displeasure and um, say that's unprofessional and unacceptable for them to, to be funded by taxpayer dollars and not provide transparency for that, for funds that are used directly for schools that are under our purview, um, that we are holding to that accountability, we're expected to hold to that accountability, and that's just on a good and perfect budget season day, but given that what we're about to go through as a, as a board and as a legal authority, um, and that we are accountable to the mayor's office and to the taxpayers of Davidson County, um, they need to be held to the same standard even though they have a charter to to educate students as they do, but it's also the service to the students and the parents um, also. So I just want to disclose that um, before we make a vote. Yes, ma'am. And, and I believe uh, Ms. Roberge may be online now. Melissa, are you, are, are you in? I, I think so. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> Would you like to okay, rephrase your you, question? Can you restate your question? Uh, sure. Um, I wanted to know how we can amend or I'm not sure how the statute works as far as getting board approval for the other two schools. When it comes to when those contracts, mm -hmm. sure, when those contracts come up mm -hmm. for either reauthorization or contract could be amended at that time. Okay. And when are those contracts are being bidden for the other two schools? Um, let me back up and get those dates for you again. Okay. 
Um, Knowledge High School um, was approved in 2015. That's 2025, 2026 uh, will be when they come up for renewal. 2025 and 2026. Yes, ma'am. Oh my God. <laughs> we're going to be in a, in a rocking chair, right? I mean, what? <laughs> Knowledge Academy Middle School comes up in 2022, okay. the school in question. Okay. All right. And, and I want to just talk about, just briefly about uh, uh, Ms. Players. Uh, she came in at a time that we, she may have followed the fight with Knowledge Academies. Mm -hmm. We have had a horrible time with the school they should actually be closed down um and the state overturned our decision we went through court cases and depositions and all the horribleness that they took us through and and as we can see um and we can applaud ourselves we were not crazy that this school uh continues to be a failure for the for our students yeah. and fran i'll just add that the knowledge academy case is still pending in chancery court that we've okay revocation decision yes thank you so is there a motion to come up on this or are we ready I think we had a more yeah we're ready for a motion okay i'm ready to make it. okay i would like to uh, make a motion to um deny nei's um management um of the knowledge academy middle school is that correct Dennis? i know they got three this, okay the middle school yes ma'am second mrs sharon who was that Sharon. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? Judge Smith, can we get a vote? Uh, this is Amy. Okay. I just want to reiterate, I made a lot of comments about this particular operation, and I'll just say it's just a shady operation out of Florida. And here we are. Um, <laughs> and I saw it coming, uh, but I just really hope that this will open some eyes uh, about how these groups operate. Unfortunately, this particular management company is still a favorite of um, a lot of the charter sector. So I hope that this sort of um, brings some people to realizations about, um, uh, you know, about uh, how we should be managing our charters and, and how this has been a failure. So thank you. Dr. Uh, uh, yes, just for clarity, I want to make sure everybody's on the same page. You're about to approve a motion to deny. So just none of that can seem confusing, but uh, let's start with the roll. Dr. Gentry? Aye. Dr. Gentry votes aye. Ms. Elrod? Aye. Ms. Elrod votes aye. Ms. Spearing? Aye. Spearing votes aye. Ms. Bugs? Aye. Ms. Bugs votes aye. Ms. Bush? Aye. Ms. Bush votes aye. Ms. Claire Peters? Aye. Ms. Claire Peters votes aye. Ms. Cooper Walker? Aye. Ms. Cooper Walker votes aye. Ms. Fogue? Aye. Ms. Fogue votes aye. Ms. Shepard? Aye. Ms. Shepard votes aye. Madam Chair, you have nine ayes. Thank you. <clears throat> we'll move on to Item number three, which is the uh, Nashville Collegiate Threat, Mr. Uh, Queen. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> pull the slide deck up. <laughs> Once again, Madam Chair, members of the board and Director of Battle, thank you for the opportunity to share the Charter Office Review Team's reports on five charter applications submitted for review. This evening, we will be presenting Nashville Collegiate Prep Ivy Prep Academy, KIPP Southeast Nashville College Prep Elementary School, KIPP Southeast Nashville College Prep Middle School, and KIPP Antioch College Prep High School. Today's objective is for the Board of Education to determine if any or all five charter applications submitted this evening will be approved or denied. This board report is derived from the review team's consensus reports, which you all received previously. We ask the board to consider and vote after each individual application presentation separately. And I have my team online uh, if there are questions in between each of the presentations that can answer your questions. There are three rating characteristics used in reviewing a charter application. Either it meets standard, partially meets standard, 
or does not meet standard. It is important to note that the, off, that the charter office and review team utilizes the National Association of Charter School Authorizer Standards, known as NAXA, and practices in its application review process as required by Tennessee State Board policy. In addition to the charter school staff, charter office staff, our review team consists of a large group of experienced professionals that cover a wide range of expertise in education. This list of expert reviewers led by Dr. Gina Smallwood reviewed both Nashville Collegiate Prep and Kemp Southeast Nashville College Prep Elementary School. A special thank you to Ms. Denise Brown, coordinator of charter schools who is new to our team for facilitating the review process. This list of expert reviewers led by Ms. Katie Enderline reviewed Ivy Prep Academy, KIPP Southeast Nashville Collegiate Prep Middle School, and KIPP Antioch College Prep High School. We will now begin with Nashville Collegiate Prep. Their academic program design, this applicant lacked a clear description of the community where the school will be located. The professional development model presented was inadequate. The recruitment plan for English language teachers was missing. Teachers requiring dual certification in English language were not answered adequately, addressed in the application or the capacity interview. The fine arts block was missing information with no reference to how it might be used for RTI. There was no clear plan around the instructional strategies for unique learners. Information around social studies and science was simply missing. And the balanced literacy block was not addressed. On the operations program design, during a due diligence search of Rethink Forward's website, it indicated a type of partnership between Rethink Forward, NEI, and Trevecca Nazarene University. Dr. Boone is the chairman of the board for Rethink Forward and president uh, for TNU. There are questions remaining on how the evaluation of NEI will be conducted in an objective manner due to this uh, relationship. The governing board is to have only three members at the start and then plan to grow over time. Second slide on operations. NEI has been selected to operate Nashville Collegiate Prep. A recent investigation concerning Knowledge Academies incorporated and operated by NEI indicated multiple findings. Listed on the slide are a number of operational concerns found after one year serving as operator with Knowledge Academies included multiple reports of low morale and lack of trust among certain staff. Six notices of concern were issued between three schools in exceptional ed and English language. A violation of state board rule addressing the use of substitutes, a violation of state board rule addressing staff suspensions, and a violation of state board policy addressing teacher observations were noted in the investigation. And from the slide that you see, there are others that are listed there that, that uh, we won't read through independently. Going to the financial program design, the transportation budgets were very low. The staffing budget was low and missing important information, particularly with the ex expectation of staff uh, to have dual certified uh, teachers. Again, dual certification in English language. There were no English language teachers budgeted as they were going to pursue dual certifications. Questions exist on how the contingency budget cuts would impact students receiving supports as there was not enough information to evaluate. The projected budget expense for National Collegiate Prep would be at $8,320,000 per year. And if you look at the net physical impact on the district, the projected net physical impact would be at about $2,890,000 per year. The review team rates National Collegiate Prep as follows. In academics, they partially meet. In operations, they partially meet. In finances, they partially meet. And at this point, we'll turn it over to the board for discussion. I just have a, I have a general question. This is Amy. Go yes, ahead. Um, so in the past, uh, I know we're not doing recommendations now, but in the past, the charter office has never recommended for approval charters that did not fully meet all of the review criteria, correct? That is correct. 
Okay, do you see any uh, reason to, to depart from this practice now? Um, I do not. Uh, ideally, they would meet standard in each of the areas. And again, historically, those when we did make recommendations, we recommended approval. But again, the board will look at the evidence submitted and discuss it and make determinations uh, from there. Okay. Um, and that's just sort of a general question because none of the uh, applications uh, this this period meet all of the recommendations. So I just want to point that out. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Anybody else have any comments or questions for Mr. Queen? All right, uh, seeing none, I would entertain a motion around the uh, National Collegiate Prep. I make a motion, this is Frida Player Peters. I make a motion to deny National Collegiate Prep for, um, uh, I guess, for charter application approval. I hope that's yeah. correct in the phrasing. Second. Yeah. Who, who did that? Amy. Okay, Second. thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion or, or questions? Dr. I just have a statement. Um, oh, yes, ma'am. Um, just in general, like for me, um, and I'll let my colleagues, we have more of a curriculum background speak on the curriculum aspects of it, but for, from the financial operations standpoint, um, for any application to become before this board, we have a fiduciary responsibility with budget and they should have the same application for any board you sit on, no matter if the budget's $10,000, $10 million or $10 billion, there's fiduciary responsibility and to, be, to present any application with limited um, explanation and detail to financial responsibility. Um, it's it's, it's um, unprofessional um, and again, inconceivable for, from my standpoint of view. I mean, there's other things we can easily go into and I'm pretty sure my other colleagues um, have, who have much more experience in this, but um, you know, have a, like for example, having a management fee that literally ranges from 10% differential, you know, that's just seemed like a lack of preparation um, and a lack of homework to do. So, um, you know, given this, the topic in general, but then also just from a criteria application standpoint, there's a standard that we need to hold um, that needs to be held no matter what you present to us as any, any organization presents to us as a board for approval for any type of contract or issue that, we are responsible for um, a budget that's almost half of the metro government's budget. We have our own responsibility, our own fiduciary responsibility. We're held to a standard and any organization coming to us must be held to the same standard that we are. So I just want that for the record for this application and for the future ones that we discuss that um, we are playing, I mean, we cannot play with students' lives or education, but more importantly, we cannot play with taxpayers' lives and education. And um, given where we are in the economy, what, how hard people work um, and contribute, um, this is just one fraction of it. Um, and so I don't want to belabor the point, but that's just something of any operation that comes before us as a board, there has to be fiduciary responsibility for that. That's just a minimal and legal requirement to be on any board member, whether you're a $10,000 board, nonprofit board, or a $10 million corporation. Um, and that has to be shown. Um, no matter who or what you are. Good comment, um, Frida. Anybody else? This I is will... Amy. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. This is Melissa. The state board policy states that if a charter application is denied, the grounds upon which it is being denied must be stated. So I would recommend rephrasing your motion to deny because of X, Y, Z, and four other reasons stated on the board floor and contained in the presentation. Okay, um, I amend my motion to deny uh, college collegiate prep application due to the lack of um, fully meeting the criteria, the financial criteria um, um, in their application and other comments that um, that have been stated in the discussion of our of our board deliberation. Hey, Amy, you want to second that? I'll, I'll second it. And then I just had a quick comment. Again, this is a general comment, but since we're talking about uh, fiduciary duties, I, I just want to say that 
we have a limited pool of funds. We are now <laughs> looking at cutting that pool quite a bit, uh, and we don't really know. Uh, our, our, our budgetary future is uncertain, and um, we have pretty clear a choice to make. I mean, we have to prioritize where those funds go. Um, we can choose to open charter seats, or we can choose to pay our teachers and our staff members. I mean, really, that's what it comes down to. Um, if we are approving new charter seats to the tune of a few million dollars, that's money that could go to pay our staff and, and all of our schools throughout the district. And so um, I just wanted to say that as a, a general matter uh, with regard to all of these uh, charter options. Thank you. Anybody else? Madam Chair, can you all see or hear me? I have yes. some comments. Yes. Okay. So this is Rachel Ann, in case you cannot see or hear me. So um, I first want to make sure that our motion is clear. Um, it's my understanding from Melissa's encouragement is that the motion needs to be not only based upon our discussion that we're having right now, but also within the materials that were provided by the Charter Office, which has, of course, much more details about how they partially met to did not meet the requirements that we have stated. So I think it's important that we have that uh, within our motion, that we made the decision not only on our discussion, but also within those materials. Um, and on that note, I have some comments to be made based upon the uh, detailed information that they provided to us. Okay. So uh, Collegiate Prep, uh, they have a clear plan of zip codes to recruit from, including one of the zip codes within my district, 37211 yet they do not have a clear understanding of how to meet the needs of students and families within those zip codes. Additionally, they do not have a balanced literacy model approach or anyone available for any of our interviews that would be involved in the day-to-day -day functions of the school. Uh, this is especially concerning, as mentioned by Dennis, uh, Rebecca Dinda is to oversee the several academic areas when the schools open, yet she resides in Florida and there are no current plans for Ms. Dinda to transfer her duties to the school itself once the school opens. Um, additionally, Rethink, who is with this, uh, has a relationship with NEI and Trebecca. There are noted concerns with Dr. Boone as the chairman of Rethink and they being Trebecca's president. And I agree with the review team and their feeling that this is a conflict of interest, especially when it comes time to evaluate NEI's performance. Additionally, they have a small governing board that will be very quickly overwhelmed with no process or timeline available to recruit new members. Um, additionally, as we heard from Dennis in his presentation, there have been various infractions and um, I agree with Frida as well that we need to have a baseline of what we expect people to come to us with, and they obviously did not meet those. Um, as we all saw in the materials that were provided, our expectation is that they partially, that they meet or that they exceed um, the financial, academic, and operational requirements. So not only should we deny this based upon their lack of academics, but also their financial and operational standards that they simply cannot meet. Okay, anybody else with any comments or questions? All right, so it's been motioned and properly seconded that we deny the charter school um, application approval for Nashville Collegiate Prep. Dr. Sevier? Dr. Gentry? Aye. Dr. Gentry votes aye. Ms. Selrod? Ms. Elrod? Unmute, Rachel. Sorry, I had another computer issue. <laughs> so Ms. sorry. Elrod? Will you restate? Uh, your vote on the motion to deny? Aye. Ms. Elrod votes aye. Ms. Spearing? Aye. Ms. Spearing votes aye. Ms. Bugs? Aye. Ms. Bugs votes aye. Ms. Bush? Aye. Ms. Bush votes aye. Ms. Player Peters? Ms. Player Peters? Sorry, aye. Ms. Player Peters votes aye. Ms. Poopa Walker? Aye. Ms. Poopa Walker votes aye. Ms. Frog? Aye. Ms. Frog votes aye. Ms. Shepard? Aye. Shepherd votes aye. Madam Chair, you have nine ayes. Okay, thank you. All right, we will move on to 
um, number four, the charter school uh, recommendation for Ivy Prep Academy. Thank you, Madam Chair. We move to the academic program design slide. There was a lack of appropriate staffing that relied too heavily on volunteers and business partners that have not been identified or engaged as of the application. Enrollment projections were not outlined. Business partners which are critical to the school are not yet determined, nor have they committed to the school. Curricular choices are not yet available and there was not a plan for the arts, which is a basis for the application. And there was not a clear plan for special populations provided and the remediation plan was unclear. Operations program design. There was a loan that was intended to cover the startup cost. It was identified in the application, but there was no indication on how the loan would be paid back. A facility has not been selected and there are additional unanswered facility questions. There is no plan for locating, hiring, or and retaining the appropriate licensed teaching staff with the requirements of extra duties for no additional pay. Mm. There are unanswered questions around staffing, professional development, and the use of data analysis. Transportation availability was unanswered. Financial program design. Teacher salary estimates are, uh, and the addition of extra responsibilities is insufficient. There is no paid leader identified to lead the financial process. There is no budget plan for CSP funds. There is a misalignment between the budget narrative and the staffing plan. And there is a deficit listed for year one with no plans to address. Budget expense, the projected budget expense would be $3,110,000 per year. The projected net fiscal impact to the district would be about $770,000 per year. Based upon the findings, the review team rates Ivy Prep Academy as partially meeting in academics, partially meeting in operation, does not meet in finances. At this time, we refer to the board. Okay, anybody have any questions for Mr. Queen concerning um, Ivy Prep? No. No questions, no comments. At this time, I would entertain a motion. <clears throat> Mrs. Bug, I move to deny uh, the, rec uh, not the recommendation, I'm sorry, to deny the charter application for Ivy Prep. This is Sharon Gentry, I second. Okay. You need to add just a, a reminder to just a reminder to include the rationale. Uh, then let me amend. I'm sorry. I move that we deny the application to Ivy Prep based on the findings developed by the charter school office, uh, suggesting that this application would not meet our standards. So Sharon Gentry, I'll, I'll second that one too. Okay. Any other comments or questions? I do. This is Rachel Ann. Yes, ma'am. All right. So in an abundance of trying to be uh, prepared, I have comments on this one as well, um, as I want to make sure that we have as much information and discussion about schools as possible. So Ivy Prep, uh, though their vision and mission states that they are career art and tech uh, centered and that they are needed in the North Asheville, North Nashville area, they have a lack of staffing in both the career and ARC academic area. And instead, as Dennis suggested, that they are trying to staff using uh, community volunteers, which is obviously not uh, an appropriate educational tool uh, for long term. This continued lack of academic planning is that they are not prepared to fully support and train. This goes along with some of their curriculums, including Engage New York and uh, TNRTI2 and other differentiated instructions. Alarmingly, they also don't have a plan or approach for their at-risk students, EE teacher supports, monitoring of IEPs, or even their EL instruction. Uh, they additionally have a very top-heavy model that is a staffing model that's excessive with no clear rationale for it. And um, though that they agree that there's a decline in middle school enrollment in the area um, and they don't know how they're going to meet their enrollment projections, they still want to open. And though there is a decline in enrollment, that would show that these seats are not needed. Um, so I uh, am thankful for the motion. 
Thank you, Ms. Elrod. Anybody else with any comments or questions? Seeing none, Dr. Sevier. Dr. Gentry? Aye. Dr. Gentry, vote sign. Ms. Elrod? Aye. Ms. Elrod, vote sign. Ms. Spearing? Aye. Spearing, vote sign. Ms. Bugs? Aye. Ms. Bugs, vote sign. Ms. Bush? Ms. Bush? Sorry, aye. Ms. Bush, vote sign. Ms. Player Peters? Aye. Ms. Player Peters, vote sign. Ms. Poopa Walker? Aye. Ms. Poopa Walker, vote sign. Ms. Frode? Aye. Ms. Frode, vote sign. Ms. Shepard? Aye. Ms. Shepard, vote sign. Madam Chair, you have nine ayes. Thank you, Dr. Sevier. All right, uh, Mr. Queen, we will move on to uh, Kent Southeast um, Elementary School. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and, and as a preface, we'll, we'll be moving into the three KIPP applications. Correct. Uh, and just um, for your information, you will see a lot of similarity uh, among our report, given that uh, KIPP is a network and submitted three applications at, uh, at one seating. Beginning with the academic program design for KIPP Southeast Nashville College Prep Elementary, the RTI process was unclear. Information is missing on how to appropriately serve English learners, particularly how the 100 minute ELA block for EL students will work, how EL, English language student assessment data will support English language instructional practices, how English learners will be a priority in the academic plan. The application does not address disproportionality. How the full inclusion model will appropriately serve all students was not addressed. Information is missing on providing individualized and appropriate academic supports to students with disabilities and English learners. And the application is generic in nature when describing the academic plan for all students, English language students and high risk students. The operations program design, the application did not discuss how the network plans to manage the startup of all three schools in addition to managing the existing seven schools. The application does not discuss the specific location and needs of the building, especially if a new building is not feasible. A timeline for identifying, financing, renovating and ensuring code compliance is non-existent. A detailed plan for obtaining highly qualified English language certified teachers is missing. There is no discussion on how the school will address situations involving students who are homeless or in foster care. The applicant did not fully address concerns around transportation for students if the need were to arise. On the financial program design, KIPP has demonstrated effective extensive fiscal policies and procedures that guide the KIPP network. KIPP has enough support and relationships to be financially stable. We will note that two KIPP charter schools in Memphis recently was announced would be closing on June 30th, uh, citing financial hardships. <clears throat> on the past performance summary, the review team doubts Southeast Nashville College Prep Elementary School will have the ability to assist in growing students. The Nashville KIPP Elementary School, which is Kirkpatrick, has demonstrated level five TVOS growth for one year, which was school year 2019, that meets standard and was designated a reward school. That same school has not shown evidence that it will successfully reach their achievement targets. College KIPP Prep, KIPP College Prep does not have growth data and will not have growth data due to the abrupt closing of the 2019-2020 school year. Without more data, we are unable to establish if KIPP Academy and National Elementary School will continue on a positive trend. Uh, the bottom line is there's a lack of uh, data over time that gives us confidence that the school will be successful. I will also note that two KIPP schools, again, in Memphis, will be closing June 30th due to being, uh, in quote, unable to fulfill the academic promise to students, teachers, and families. Again, this came to light just recently. The projected budget expense would be $6,480,000 per year. The projected net physical impact on the district would be about $2,270,000 per year. Based upon the report findings, the school partially meets in academics, partially meets in operations, meets in finances, partially meets in past performance. 
And at this time, we'll turn it over to the board for discussion. Uh, Dennis, what did they, how did they score in their operations plan? I missed that. The operations partially met. Partially met, okay. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Anybody have any questions or comments? I do, Madam Chair. Okay. As you guys know, um, my dear colleagues, y'all know that this is, um, these next three are gonna be mine in my district. And I've had an opportunity to uh, work with um, Randy and I've had an opportunity to visit the, the, the school, the very first school out here in Southeast Davidson County, which is uh, the elementary startup. And they have um, so far demonstrated um, great gains. Uh, the students, uh, parents are very much so pleased. They have a lot of support, um, uh, uh, support behind them. And I have had an opportunity to go to um, meetings just to listen. And they are definitely invested in this school. They are looking for expansion. They want us, they want um, more expansion, of course. Um, and so that's why these applications have been presented. However, um, I am concerned about um, the slides on our EL students. Of course, you guys know that Southeast Davidson County serves um, a very high population. And so I would like to see if um, Randy is going to um, come back for an amendment um, to show that uh, they will be meeting uh, the necessary requirements in these areas. Of course, we're in a, a, a dangerous time with our budget, um, so I'm not um, comfortable right now at this time to support the school. Um, this is the second um, reason why I will um, deny this this um, application, um, and I'm open to hear um, other colleagues' uh, comments. Anybody else have any comments or questions? Um, this is Jeannie. Uh, I'd like to just say a couple of things. One, I, I will say that KIPP has uh, obviously a long track record in MNPS, unlike, um, you know, the previous applications and, and even uh, a good number of the charters that are in our district. They have, um, I would say, gone above and beyond most other charter schools. I mean, their work at Kip Kirkpatrick to get a five in growth is um, not a small feat. That was one of the lowest performing schools in the district. And Kirkpatrick, um, Kip took over Kirkpatrick for us and has put in a ton of time and energy to turn that school around. So getting to a level five is not an insignificant thing. Um, I also don't feel that the Memphis Kip um, issues uh, should be brought to bear here. I don't think it's related. I think Randy, or I should say um, Mr. Dowell and his entire team have um, shown significant financial discipline and operations, you know, the ability to execute on operations for many years now. Um, so I don't think that is necessarily a cause for concern. I, I would like to see them meet on all criteria um, for sure. But for me, at the end of the day, it comes down to the fiscal crisis that we're in. And I just think it's untenable now to try to, to vote in favor of these schools at this time. And so I'm I won't be voting to support them, but I do want to recognize that they have done tremendous work, including for uh, many immigrant families in Nashville who um, have very positive feelings about the KIPP network. And so um, I'll just, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Okay. Anybody else? Madam Chair. Yes, yes ma'am. Go ahead, Dr. Gentry. Uh, I was just going to, uh, thank you, Ms. Bugs. Um, just to sort of, uh, echo what um, uh, Ms. Poopoo Walker said, uh, Kip, Kip has been an amazing partner for us um, over the years. Um, they have, have, may have been, again, I, I won't say the only, uh, but one of very few charter operators who have um, taken the time to sit down at the table with us and actually discuss what our needs are uh, in, the, in, in the space of where uh, charter operators can actually provide support. Uh, and I believe that, um, you know, these applications are a response to the concerns of growth in the Antioch area that have been expressed by this board. And, you know, I can just hear, you know, Ms. Bush, just constant question. So when am I gonna get some more schools? When am I gonna get some more schools? But 
you know, to the, the points that have been made right now, um, fiscally, where, the way we're positioned and we're literally robbing Peter to pay Paul um, just to do and provide the basic and fundamental needs for our students. Uh, and given the uncertainty of what the fall will look like, um, I, I think about the kinds of supports we have been able to provide over the summer for our students, the way we've been able to engage our students over the summer, and given our current um, situation with COVID-19 and our current financial situation, those things are all different for us this year. Um, very minimal and very, very different. So right now I just don't think that it is fiscally prudent um, to, to venture into this space of, of, of removing more funds from the district to support uh, charters. Thank you, Dr. Gentry. Anybody else? Uh, Madam Chair, this is Bugs. Yes, ma'am. Um, so a couple of conflicting thoughts, actually. Yes, you know, I, I know that Antioch needs another school, so I do appreciate that KIPP uh, didn't try to send one to an already saturated, saturated district, but they actually are trying to help us meet a need because we don't, I mean, we don't have capital funds to put anything in Antioch for years unless we kind of rethink through some, you know, some things we've committed to already because we, we just won't have money for decades to build another building in a district that actually needs a building, you know, that does not have what it needs. So I appreciate you for doing that. But again, even beyond them being able to help us purchase a building, I appreciate that, but we just still don't, I mean, with the pandemic and the uncertainty of the future, we just know that we're not going to be able to give our students what they need. So with that, I would like to call for the question and uh, I would make a motion that we deny the charter application for KIPP Southeast Nashville Middle School. Can, Can I get a second? A, Go ahead. Can I make a comment before we move on? Um, let me just, I just want, we talk a lot about these sorts of partnerships and I, I wrote a social media post several years ago and I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but um, just about KIPP and its finances. And um, so I was responding to questions about how nonprofit charter schools make money and make profit even if they're supposedly nonprofit. And I identified uh, four different ways. One was a 39% federal tax credit that allows investors to double their money in seven years. Second, um, land deals, which include uh, using taxpayer money to fund private land investments that profit the investor and not taxpayers. The third was requiring students to purchase materials from board members at marked up prices or charging students high prices for lunches or other necessities. And the fourth was taking money from classrooms and driving it up to the top, for example, by hiring keep, uh, cheaper, inexperienced, uncertified teachers by using computers instead of teachers for classroom instruction um, or by using uncertified teachers for enrichment like art and music. Um, specifically with regard to KIPP, um, I wrote a lot about their finances. And I think it's important to note that KIPP Nashville is a private corporation that's part of a national corporate chain of KIPP charter schools. The Kidd Foundation, um, at the time I wrote this post in 2015, had amassed net assets, net assets of over $31 million. KIPP in New York had amassed about $18 million in net assets. And in Texas, they amassed net assets over $22 million. Much of the money comes from uh, grants from the federal government. Some comes from charitable donations. And of course, we, you know, we also fund these schools with our tax dollars. KIPP spends this money lavishly. Over a six year period, the KIPP Foundation spent $16 million on travel to places such as Opryland Hotel, Disney Swan and Dolphin Hotel, Rio Suite Hotel and Casino and Red Rock Casino and Vegas. A local teacher who formerly worked at a KIPP school sent me a message during this time. He said, quote, during my one year at KIPP, I was stunned at the lavish spending, sending everyone across the country to summit in Las Vegas, hotels, convention spaces, food, drinks, entertainment, the whole deal, even before the year started. Then once the year started, no money for paper, no money for subs, and certainly no interest in any teacher staying long enough to see salary increases. It struck me as bizarre. I knew what flights to Vegas and hotels um, their cost. What could each teacher have done with that money for supplies? Um, there are also many ways uh, that KIPP leaders can double or triple their income through the school network. For example, the co-founder of KIPP Foundation it was, uh, was simultaneously paid a six-figure salary for his work at the foundation, another six-figure salary for consulting with KIPP Foundation, um, doing work that he ordered, a uh, third six-figure salary for acting as superintendent of KIPP schools in New York City. So his total annual salary was uh, over $468,000. Uh, 
um, on uh, the most recent 990 form back in 2015, KIPP Academy Nashville, which was the only KIPP school for which I could find uh, 990 forms listed $7.7 million in total assets and $5.5, $5.3 million in net assets. Uh, KIPP Nashville and KIPP Memphis each got a million dollars through the federal Race to the Top grants. KIPP Nashville also received $2 million in 2012 from the Charter School Growth Fund to help the expansion. Uh, KIPP Memphis received $3 million in uh, 2011 from the Charter School Growth Fund, which allowed it to expand to 10 times its size. Uh, the Charter School Growth Fund is a Denver-based based venture capital fund, and venture capital funds exist to make money. Um, a venture capital fund would not invest in a charter school without the expectation of a clear financial return on its investment. Um, and so, you know, and we also know that as our, our charter schools expand, less funding is available for uh, our traditional schools. So I, I think it's important that, you know, we can talk about our local leaders or the local schools, but I think it's important to recognize that this is where some of our um, tax dollars are going. Um, there is not local accountability on this kind of thing and the spending. I mean, I could go on, I've written lots about KIPP, uh, but I just think it's important to note that that is money that we could be using to serve all students in the district, um, to serve the children who are the most costly to educate. These are the children that often don't end up in charter schools because they have special needs of some sort. And um, I just, I think it's important to note that, that that's what we're funding, those kinds of things in addition to whatever we're funding locally. Thank you. This is Rachel and I have a comment I keep trying to make. Go for it. Oh, thank you. Um, I think I'm dealing with a delay. So um, I, my comment about uh, KIPP Southeast Elementary School is that um, we keep talking about their local control and of course their financial plan uh, does seem to meet it, meet our standards, but everything else under academic, operational and past performance shows that they partially meet our standards. And once again, we're supposed to be going for meets to goes above and beyond. And additionally, I wanna make sure that we have uh, other comments made that operationally that they, we say they partially meet, but, and that's because they have experience opening schools um, and they have a solid plan for a startup year. However, after that startup year, they do not have and do not include lots of information um, about how they continue. And that is potentially why they're closing schools, like as mentioned in Memphis um, five days ago. So um, I wanna make sure that we refer back to the committee materials as there are lots of concerns and questions about KIPP having enough support and relationships to be financially stable within it. Additionally, there's information about how it's unclear with their retention plans for EL students and within the EL service plans and that their inclusion model may not meet students with disabilities and it would not continue those students uh, services that are desperately needed. So I wanna make sure that we refer back to those things as well. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle Rod. <clears throat> Anybody else have any comments or questions? I do. Madam yes, ma'am. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm clear um, that, um, yes, we do need more schools out here. Um, and if we uh, haven't forgotten that we have uh, land that we just got, we purchased. So we will be getting another school out here, uh, middle school within the next two to three years, hopefully, depends on our budget. Um, so we are working to instill uh, more buildings out here for our students, but it would be irresponsible for me not to be consistent with the application process. And that's not just for KIPP, it's for all of our um, applications. So I wanna make it very clear that it's not about um, just um, needing more schools. Yes, we do, but we have to be fiscal responsible and we have to make sure that we're following the process and be consistent when it comes to these applications. Thank you. Anybody else? <clears throat> uh, we have a motion made by Ms. Bugs to deny the application for Kip Elementary School Southeast. Did we get a second on that? Well, can I restate it to make sure I include the uh, okay. reason why? So I move to, to deny the application for Kip Southeast uh, because of fiscal implicate, negative fiscal implications on the rest of the district exacerbated by both a tornado recovery and a pandemic. Okay, do we have a second? Second, this is Frida Player-Peters. Thank you, Frida. Okay, 
Dr. Sevier. Dr. Gentry. Aye. Dr. Gentry votes aye. Ms. Selma. We, we didn't have discussion. Could we? Oh, I thought that's what we were having. Okay. I'm sorry. Yes. I'm sorry. I was going to say on that particular motion, I don't think we can deny a charter school just based on fiscal impact. So I think we're going to have to state. Well, I actually, I talked to Metro Legal and yeah, we can. Okay, Melissa. I'm trying, you... to, I'm trying to think through every different way that the state board would say, no, you all can't deny this. And this seems reasonable. It seems objective. I would think that they would hear and know that we have um, a budget restraint, like we're in a budget crisis right now. So I think they would, I'm hoping that they would see our point of view with this type of motion. I mean, we can, you know, this I, is Rachel. Oh, sorry, Melissa, go ahead. That's okay. I, I think maybe the correct way to sort of catch everybody's comments is that the motion would be to deny based on fiscal impact other concerns noted during the discussion and points made during the presentation. Yes. yes. Okay, thanks, Melissa. I'm, I'm good. You're welcome. The, so you're saying that has to be it? That's what I have to do? That would be the most clear way path going forward. Okay. Then uh, I'll restate the motion. I move that we deny the application for KIPP Southeast due to fiscal implications and um, comments noted during our discussion. Ms. Platt Peters, do you second that? Second. Okay. Great. Okay. Any more discussion? Okay, Dr. Sevier. Dr. Gentry. Aye. Dr. Gentry votes sign. Ms. Selrod. Aye. Ms. Selrod votes sign. Ms. Spearing. Aye. Ms. Spearing votes sign. Ms. Bugs. Aye. Ms. Bugs votes sign. Ms. Bush. Aye. Ms. Bush votes sign. Ms. Player Peters. Aye. Player Peters votes on Ms. Cooper Walker. Aye. Cooper Walker votes on Ms. Froge. Aye. Ms. Froge votes on Ms. Shepard. Aye. Ms. Shepard votes on Madam Chair. You have nine ayes. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, we will move on to, uh, excuse me, number six on the agenda, which is the um, Charter School Committee recommendation for Kip Southeast Middle School. Thank you, we'll go to the academic program slide. For the academic program design, the RTI process is unclear. Information is missing on how to appropriately serve English learners. Three examples, how the 100 minute ELA block for English language students will work, how English language student assessment data will support English language instructional practices, how English learners will be a priority in the academic plan. The application does not address disproportionality. How the full inclusion model will appropriately serve all students was not addressed. Information is missing on providing individualized and appropriate academic supports to students with disabilities and English learners. And the application again is generic in nature when describing the academic plan for all students along with English language and high risk students. The operations program design. The application did not discuss how the network plans to manage the startup of all three schools in addition to managing the existing seven schools. The application does not discuss the specific location and needs of the building, especially if a new building is not feasible. A timeline for identifying, financing, renovating, and ensuring code compliance is non-existent. A detailed plan for obtaining highly qualified English language certified teachers is missing. There is no discussion on how the school will address situations involving students who are homeless or in foster care. The applicant did not fully address concerns around transportation for students if the need arises. Financial program design. KIPP has demonstrated effective extens uh, extensive fiscal policies and procedures that guide the KIPP network. KIPP has enough support and relationships to be financially stable. And once again, recent information came to light that two KIPP charter schools in Memphis will be closing June 30. One reason cited was financial hardships. Past performance summary, the KIPP Nashville Middle Schools have demonstrated a growth pattern that does meet standard. 
Kip Academy Middle and Kip Nashville College Prep have both had level five growth in the past two years. Based on this data, Kip Southeast College Prep Middle School has the ability to assist in growing students. Again, recently coming to light, two Kip schools in Memphis will be closing June 30 due to being unable to fulfill the academic promise to students, teachers, and families. Budget expense, the projected budget expense would be $3,870,000 per year. The projected net fiscal impact to the district would be about $1,410,000 per year. <clears throat> Based upon this, the review team rates KIPP Southeast Nashville College Prep Middle School as partially meeting academics, partially meeting in operations, meets in finances, and meets in past performance. At this time, we turn it over to the board. Okay. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Queen concerning the uh, middle school? Okay, middle school application. Any comments? Madam Chair. Yes, ma'am. Um, in the course of life uh, in my district, and um, I have a conversation with Randy, and again, I'm sure he's going to come back and amend. Uh, his application to meet uh, all indicators. Um, at that time, uh, we probably just mindful that that's something that we will be uh, working to again to see where we are uh, when he does come back with the amendment. Um, I think the Chuck School Office is going to be working with him on uh, any of his questions, uh, those indicators that he did not meet. Um, again, parents want expansion for kids, uh, middle. Uh, and elementary, and we'll be looking at high school next. Um, I do support our parents. It's all about them. It's all about. I've always said that. Um, but again, at this time, uh, it, is, uh, it is responsible for us to be consistent with our application process uh, on uh, being able to review and determine um, what's been met and uh, not on one or more indicators. Um, so uh, that's my comment. Okay. Any other comments or questions? And just as a reminder, this is for the middle school, Kit Southeast uh, Middle School charter application. This is Rachel Ann. I have comments. Yes, ma'am. All right, so overall, as Dennis said, that there was a lack of details. Uh, those details even included what community they want to serve with their location, which is maybe particularly alarming as they couldn't decide between Cambridge or Antioch. Um, and like the elementary school, there are continuing and ongoing concerns about English language learners. Overall, KIPP did not have a full or expansive plan for applying for all three of these schools. Um, opening an elementary and middle school in one year is going to be a large load. Um, and then including, of course, a high school in the following year. And all that together is a lot to manage. Um, and they are, were not able to prove within their answers when they came in for their interview. And then they had their follow-ups that they would be able to manage that. And again, they are closing their two schools in Memphis because of some financial hardships. So being able to operationally start a school is very different than being um, sustainable and continuing a school. And I think it's important that we have those things noted as different. Um, again, Kip Middle um, does not meet all three of the academic, operational and financial uh, requirements that we have listed. And we need to keep those things in mind as well. Thank you, Ms. Elrod. Anybody else? Uh, well, I just want to echo Ms. Elrod's um, not meeting the collective standard um, for a charter review, but also um, just as for the conversation as a whole, looking at the net cost, um, going back to financial impact, um, you know, early this year, mid halfway through this fiscal year, um, school employees received a raise. Um, and that was partially funded by government and mostly came out of our um, our savings uh, from last fiscal year and looking at we have to continue to fulfill that commitment going into next fiscal year. I mean, we're roughly about over $5 million um, and um, that we could go to fund to maintain our commitment to current employees um, to sustain given that what we're probably looking to face in the future this upcoming budget process that we'll probably have more in detail on Thursday. But um, this kind of like the fiscal impact, we have commitments that we have to stay in and the cost of opening all these in as a whole, as aggregate, 
um, is meeting our financial commitment to our employees as one of the options um, that we can look at. So um, partially, you know, part of the conversation is there's a standard for applications and at the bare minimum, they at least need to meet all of these because that's their fiduciary responsibility academically, operation-wise and, and fiscal-wise, but then also our responsibility to make sure we maintain our previous commitments also that we need to have a larger conversation. And I'm pretty sure you, the veterans probably had more of this conversation, but me being the rookie and the freshman, um, really having a conversation of where growth needs to happen, where demographic shifts, um, and how we are continually evolving and having that conversation along with current applications. Um, and I know most of these are in the Antioch area and there's been a large growth in the Antioch area. Um, and so KIPP is trying to reach um, that need, but also as we consider these as a whole, continue reviewing um, that, that demographic information um, as we consider these. This is Rachel Land again. Yes, ma'am. I think it's important that we note, uh, we keep talking about fiscal impact, which as y'all know from in the past, that is a ongoing comment and conversation that I have. But it's, uh, I wanna make sure that we're also clear with all of our details and our facts. So Dennis, Tennessee Code annotated 4913108 states that the local board of education may consider whether the establishment of the proposed public charter school will have a substantial negative fiscal impact on the LEA, such as the authorization of the public charter school and whether it would be in the best interest of the students, LEA or the community. So we keep talking about whether we can do it or not. I wanna make sure that we have noted that we are able to do it, but it's not just the fiscal impact. The fiscal impact should not be the only reason why, but it is a massive reason why. Um, and we do have that legal authority through that. So wanna make sure that I have that comment made. Thank you, Ms. Delroy. Anybody else? All right. Rachel, and I just wanted to say thank you for the clarification. Um, I just want to make sure that when the, these go up on appeal that we don't open ourselves up to um, uh, being overturned if we're, if we're relying solely on fiscal impact, but I certainly agree with everyone that that's a major factor. Agreed, agreed. Okay. If there are no other comments and or questions, we will uh, have, I will entertain a motion. Motion to deny um, the charter school application for um, is it Southeast Collegiate Middle School, official title, due to not meeting all the standards set by the charter's office of meeting all the necessary expectations and the deliberations of this body. Thank you. Can I get a second? Second. second. Who is that? I think it was Rachel Ann and Jill in unison. Okay. All right, any other, any other discussion around the middle school application? I'm sorry, did we say Southeast Collegiate? It's supposed to be KIPP. So what, which, what was stated? I'm sorry, I missed that. Uh, we are voting now on the Southeast National Middle School application. KIPP, right? KIPP, KIP, yes. Okay. okay. Yes. I may want to rephrase her, but Collegiate, Southeast Collegiate. to say Kip, middle. Any other discussion or questions? Anna, did you hear me? What? I said she's gonna have to reframe her, she had to um, redo her motion because she said Southeast Collegiate. It's oh, okay. I, That's what I'm trying to, I'm trying to get it clear. Oh, out. okay, I see where you're coming from. Okay. So I made my motion that we deny the charter application for Kip Southeast uh, college prep middle school okay. um, based on the not meeting the standards set by the charter school office um, the, uh, and um, the deliberations of this body. Okay. Are you good with that second, Rachel and Jill? Yes, ma'am. Second. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, Dr. Severe. Dr. Gentry. Aye. Dr. Gentry votes aye. Ms. Elrod. Aye. Ms. Elrod votes aye. Ms. Spearing. Aye. Ms. Spearing votes aye. Ms. Bugs. Aye. Ms. Bugs votes aye. Ms. Bush. Aye. Ms. Bush votes aye. Ms. Player Peters. Aye. Ms. Player Peters votes aye. Ms. Poopa Walker. Aye. Ms. Poopa Walker votes aye. Ms. Frog. Aye. Ms. Frog votes aye. Ms. Shepard. Aye.
Shepherd votes aye. Madam Chair, you have nine ayes. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, Ms. Queen, you are on for the uh, last presentation here for um, the uh, Charter School uh, Committee recommendation for Kip Antioch College Prep High School. Yes, ma'am. We'll start with the academic program design. The applicant's RTI process and program is unclear on how it will effectively improve student outcomes. The plan does not have a documented plan of action relative to how the school will avoid developing a pattern of disproportionality. The application was vague in how individualized and appropriate academic supports would be available to students with disabilities and English learners. Retention rates at their current high school are uh, high. Attrition rates increase each year and get larger from grades 9 to 11 with a very low attrition rate at grade 12, attrition rate being students who leave the school. This indicates the retention policy uh, does not support uh, students in meeting graduation requirements. There is limited access to retaking courses, which could lead to student retentions and withdrawals. AP for all, that's advanced placement for all without support, cannot serve all children. And that was lacking in the application. The application was generic in nature when describing the academic plan for all students, along with English language students and high risk students. The operations program design, the application did not discuss how the network plans to manage the startup of all three schools, in addition to managing the existing seven schools. The application does not discuss the specific location and needs of the building, especially if a new building is not feasible. A timeline for identifying, financing, renovating, and ensuring code compliance is non-existent. A detailed plan for obtaining highly qualified English language certified teachers is missing. There's no discussion on how the school will address situations involving students who are homeless or in foster care. And the applicant did not fully address concerns around transportation for students if the need were to arise. The financial program design, KIPP has demonstrated effective extensive physical policies and procedures that guide the KIPP network. KIPP has enough support and relationships to be financially stable. And recent news uh, is that two KIPP charter schools in Memphis will be closing on June 30th, citing financial hardships. On the past performance summary, the current KIPP Nashville High School has not demonstrated a growth pattern that meets standard. In both the 2017-18 and 2018-19 school years, the school has had TVOS growth at level one, which falls below standard. There is no evidence that the proposed school will be successful given the lack of previous performance data that meets standard. And once again, recent news is that two KIPP schools in Memphis will be closing June 30 due to being unable to fulfill the academic promise to students, teachers, and families. The budget expense, the projected budget expense would be $9,960,000 per year. The projected net fiscal impact to the district would be about $4,340,000 per year. Based upon the review team's conclusions, the review team rates KIPP Antioch College Prep High School as partially meeting academics, partially meeting in operations, meets in finances, does not meet in past performance. And at this time, we turn it over to the board. Okay. Anybody have any questions or comments for Mr. Queen? All right. I do. Sorry, this is Rachel Ann. Go ahead, Rachel Ann. All right. Again, I want to thank, uh, I want to thank Dennis. There, I, pop up. I want to thank Dennis again for, and all of course, everyone that's on the review committee. Um, the review materials were detailed and I really appreciate it. And I want to make sure that I highlight um, some of that additional information that was included there. Additional, again, the KIPP high school application, just like the middle school application. And we talked about a little bit with the elementary application. There was an overall lack of overall details with their graduation pathway from EL and EE students to retention of students in general. So again, we should really expect more applications from these 
uh, operators. They should be able to provide better details, especially for an organization like KIPP that has so many schools already. Um, they should have better information and better timelines, whether that's for financing, which they don't have, or whether it's for their plan of how to obtain highly qualified teachers, which additionally they do not have. Um, I want to once again, just in case we need to put it back into our discussion for each individual school, since we're voting on each one um, independently, I want to make sure I mention again, Tennessee annotated 4913108 regarding our fiscal impact, as that continues to be our comments that we have as a board. I completely understand and respect those, that that's a reason why we should deny this, but we want to make sure that we have it appropriately stated. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Silva. Anybody else with any comments or questions? All right, I will at this point in time entertain a motion. I move to deny the KIPP application uh, based on the deficiencies identified by the Charter Office um based upon discussion by the board and based upon the fiscal impact to the district second well, Frida. okay and it was that Frida that did that yes okay, okay. any other discussion all right dr severe dr gentry hi dr gentry both sign Ms. delron hi Ms. Delroy votes aye, Ms. Spearing. Aye. Ms. Spearing votes aye, Ms. Bugs. Aye. Ms. Bugs votes aye, Ms. Bush. Aye. Ms. Bush votes aye, Ms. Player Peters. Aye. Ms. Player Peters votes aye, Ms. Cooper Walker. Aye. Ms. Cooper Walker votes aye, Ms. Frog. Aye. Ms. Frog votes aye, Ms. Shepard. Aye. Ms. Shepard votes aye. Madam Chair, you have nine ayes. Okay. All right, Mr. Queen, this gets you off the hot seat. We're done with you tonight. Thank you so much for you and your team and what you did to present us, you know, uh, thorough information around these charter school applicants. And I, if I might remind my colleagues that I did talk with Ms. Rogers the other day that these applicants who were denied, and we denied all of them, do have 30 days in which they can bring back a cleaned up supposedly application for us and apply to us again if we deny them a second time then they can go before the state uh, board to seek um, application approval so we'll probably see them again is what i guess i'm trying to to get down to so just a fyi and uh thank you for staying with us everybody uh, we're moving on to uh, the director's report, um, Dr. Battle. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, um, in my director's report, I'll be providing a very brief uh, remote and learning 2.0 update for all board, meeting, board members. Yesterday, we launched remote learning 2.0 to ensure that there will be a strong structure in place for MPS students to continue learning at home even as our school facilities remain closed for the rest of the school year. With Remote Learning 2.0, we're committing to a program that will help students maintain their academic progress through regular class assignments and contact with their teachers. We want to give every student every tool we can, can provide to help them stay on track during this extended break from traditional classroom instruction and interaction. To facilitate this new level of virtual asynchronous engagement, we've loaned more than 3,000 laptops to students who need them. We'll be sending out about 4,000 more very soon, and we had received requests for 2,000 more laptops as of this morning. And we're working hard to process and schedule delivery for all of those. Each device is loaded with the appropriate materials for the particular student who will be receiving it. We've also held virtual training sessions with principals, teachers, and support staff to get them comfortable with online teaching practices, comfortable with expectations for them and their students, and comfortable with how to use Schoology. I think we've all said the word Schoology more in the last week than we've had all year. With Remote Learning 2.0, although teachers are not taking attendance or grading assignments, we are asking everyone to take on more accountability over the next three and a half weeks from students and parents to teachers, principals, and our staff here at the central office. 
we all need to do our part to make sure students continue to learn and stay on track for the next grade. Students in grades 5 through 11 started assess accessing their course materials on Schoology yesterday, while students in grades 3 and 4 will start next Monday, May 4th. Teachers in pre-K through second grade will continue to engage with students around new blended learning opportunities and learning packets. We've had some challenges with remote learning since school buildings were closed last month, and we know we'll continue. We didn't expect this to be a perfect solution from the start, but we always talk about striving for continuous improvement in the work we do, and our goal with this endeavor is no different. We will listen, we will learn, we will adapt, and we will get better and better. Before I wrap up my report, I want to thank a few people for all the work they've done to get Remote Learning 2.0 up and running. Um, Chief Academic Officer David Williams and his team for building the academic program and making sure teachers have the materials they need for an unprecedented instructional environment. Executive Director of Learning Technology Doug Renfro and his team for getting everyone up to speed on the technical side of distributing laptops to students and training our educators. Executive Officer Sean Braystead and his communications team for all of their work, um, enormous work on getting all of our communications out and in a very efficient and productive manner. All of our principals and their leadership teams across the district for communicating with us at the central office and with their teachers. The teachers themselves whose flexibility, commitment and dedication to their students make all of this possible. And of course, the students and their families for adapting to this environment. As a parent myself, even though my children aren't in school yet, I know how challenging it can be to keep up with kids while working from home at the same time. I appreciate everyone who is doing everything possible to make this work. Also want to thank our transportation, nutrition services, and community achieves teams who have now delivered almost 172,000 breakfasts and lunches and more than 17,000 food boxes and nearly 3,700 food bags to our students since March 23rd. Finally, I'm grateful to all of you on the board for your support and your leadership throughout the community. I look forward to working with you and keeping you updated as we move through the final weeks of the school year and into the summer. We will get through this time together and we will come out stronger together <coughs> on the other side. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Battle. All right, so we don't have announcements on the agenda, but we're gonna go ahead and do announcements anyway. And we'll start with uh, Dr. Gentry. Do you have any announcements at this time? Um, nothing. I just I do want to thank the district, uh, Dr. Battle and her team for the efforts um, in device distribution. I know that I've given some feedback um, <laughs> on, um, you know, some of the challenges that still exist. Um, and, and I know we didn't open it up for questions, but I'm just curious um, as to maybe in your next report or in an update, you can provide just um, how many students are actually interacting with Schoology um, and how are teachers and, and building level leaders, virtual building level leaders, um, reaching out to students that if you have evidence that they have not interacted with Schoology? Yes, um, we can definitely do that. Um, one thing I did not share in my board report last week, we had a pretty strong effort as a district reaching out to families to access their access to um, internet, to devices, and also to food. And part of that was connecting with every student to make sure that they were prepped and ready to go um, for interacting in Schoology this week. And so at our next report, um, possibly by even by the end of the week, I can definitely provide some numbers and updates for the board. Thank you, Dr. Battle. Um, Ms. Elroy. I do have comments. Okay. All right, so uh, first I wanna thank uh, Mr. Renfro as talked about with the heavy lifting that our IT team is working on. Um, he stated last week that we're loaning out about 500 computers a day and that's an exceptional amount of technology that our students are accessing and the amount of families that we're serving. Um, we are, we have had difficulties as noted trying to get to all those students and that's because we have never been prepared for a pandemic and so i am so impressed with how we have done that and i want to say thank you so much for the incredible lifting that they're doing of not making sure that they only have a laptop but that it's a usable accessible and working laptop as well that's a huge part of that work and of course uh i'm sure the incredible amount of password requests that they have received this week as we have <laughs> 
launched. Um, on a much different note, um, I want to say that we have learned that one of our McMurray Middle School band teachers, uh, Mrs. Marion Wheeler, passed away recently from what is believed to be COVID-19 related issues. And uh, the loss of Mrs. Wheeler is a tragic loss, not only for the McMurray Middle School family and MMPS, but is of course a very tragic loss for her family and for her husband. Uh, Marianne, Marianne, excuse me, had a plan to retire at the end of the school year. And as such, they were preparing for the retirement home in Florida. And so it is uh, so tragic, not only to lose a teacher and an educator that has devoted their life to the betterment of students, um, but also right when they are starting to enjoy their wonderful, beautiful life um, on their own terms and on their own freedom. And so I so am sorry to their family and uh, wanna make sure that we uh, put a personal face to this uh, global pandemic. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Berry. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I wanna thank uh, Dr. Battle and her team for all of the work that, uh, that has gone on these last six weeks, uh, distributing food to the students and families who need it the most and uh, getting the, working with the community in order to access Wi-Fi for our students so that these computers will uh, will work at their most efficient uh, use to to promote the uh, distance learning. Uh, and I will go ahead uh, if it's all right with you, um, Ms. Shepard, and give a brief report on the Teaching and Learning Committee meeting today. Thank you. Teaching and Learning Committee met today, April the 28th at four o'clock electronically. This was our second meeting this month. Two items were on the agenda. One, United Way, which is an organization that is offering funding for our summer school. And the second item was to approve the recommendations of the ELA committee, the ELA adoption committee. Amy Frog made a motion to approve the recommendation of the ELA committee for grades K, K through five for a three year period with the caveat that materials be used within our current balanced literacy framework with an array of other supplemental materials and also to approve the ELA committee recommendation for uh, the remaining grades uh, for, uh, which would be uh, six through 12 uh, for the remaining six years. Eight board members were present and the motion was unanimous. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sure, thank you, Ms. Ferry. Mm -hmm. Ms. Bubbs. I don't have everything, just a thank okay. you to everyone working hard. Okay, Ms. Bush? Uh, no comments, thank you. Okay, Ms. Prudipoyer? Uh, just echo what everyone else said about the work of the administration and the staff um, upscaling this. I know there's a lot of comparisons to the district compared to private schools. Um, they only had one school to deal with or maybe three at most um, in that um, they able to give out thousands of meals and um, working on the laptops and scaling it up to a district our size in such a short amount of time. Just kudos to the work. I know it wasn't perfect, um, but it, you know it's getting done um, and we're reaching that. So just thank you for all your hard work and effort. Uh, Principal Walker. And I wanna echo all that. I also wanna just give a shout out to all of the volunteers that have worked to distribute food. Um, so many people show up every day to help distribute food, um, individuals, organizations. Also want to thank National Public Education Foundation for starting a, um, a community of nonprofits that are gathering um, regularly to, to sort of collaborate on how to best support the district at this time. So just appreciate people being nimble at this time. And then I also want to give a really big shout out to two students, Abby Kutcher, who's an 11th grader at Hillsborough and is a reporter with the Hillsborough Globe and Annalise Lyle, who's a senior at Hillwood and reports for Topper TV. Both of them have been participating in uh, Mayor Cooper's pressers every morning and are able to ask questions on behalf of students across Nashville. Um, big shout out to Susan Stracinger, their advisor at Hillsborough and Corey Burton, their, Burton, their advisor at Hillwood. Um, journalism is alive and well in our, with our students and even through this pandemic, they're showing up and, and being present. So big shout out to them. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Crow. 
I have no announcements. Just thank you all okay. for the meeting. <clears throat> and I'll just uh, echo my colleagues and, and say thank you to Dr. Battle and, uh, and all her team. I've heard nothing but kudos around the work involved. And, and I know it was a lot of heavy lifting for many people. And I, I'm very appreciative. I heard one complaint in my entire district that we got straightened out. It was a, an underclassman at McGavick High School needing a laptop. And I, you know, I told him, hold on, they were doing the seniors first. I said, let me know if you don't get one. He got one. So all is well. And I'm very appreciative that we made this work because we've never done this before. We've never been through a pandemic before, and that was precipitated by a tornado. So, you know, I think that kudos are in store for um, everyone who has helped us uh, regroup from this. And so, uh, seeing no further business, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody, for being here. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.org.